Play. <laughs> All right, so I'll start by introducing Joe Desambra. Uh, it's our great pleasure to have you here, Joe, to present our Advanced Neuroscience uh, Seminars, the Advanced Neuroscience Program. So Joe uh, is, an, is an Associate Professor at the Department of Neuroscience at the University of Florida, and he has been, been trained in Florida and then moved to Kentucky for, to build up his lab and now he's back to Florida, right? And he's also uh, an assistant dean of health, uh, of diversity, health and equity uh, at the University of Florida. And he's been working uh, on how protein synthesis go defective uh, in tau apathies, especially in terms of interaction of tau protein, the tau protein, as most of you know about, of Alzheimer's disease, but which also happens and go already in other neurodegenerative disorders, and he's been working on the interaction between tau and ribosomes and how tau uh, turns protein synthesis defective. Uh, he's collaborated with us recently in our uh, paper of 2019, and it's a pleasure to have you here, Joe. He's a good friend, and I, I'm pretty sure everyone will be interested in your uh, talk, in your seminar, and in your results. So it's with you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, um, I'm going to try something different. Uh, and, and please chat and tell me if it doesn't make any sense. Somos países hermanos y para mí es muy especial tener esta oportunidad para dar esta charla. Eh, Michelle, muchas gracias. Es un honor. Y, y bueno, eh, uh, that's about the extent of my Spanish and, 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 and what I'll, I'll talk about today. It is about translation anyway, but uh, thank you very much for that generous introduction. Um, being Colombian, eh, siendo países hermanos, siempre me gusta hablar de García Márquez. Um, Gabriel García Márquez um, ended up with some form of dementia, unfortunately, at the end of his life, but we're very proud of him. And that's why I gave this uh, as an honor, uh, an homage to the title of my presentation, which is a very dramatic um, in the uh, of, uh, love and other demons. So uh, I just want to ask the audience if, uh, sorry, if um, you can tell me which book gave Garcia Marquez the Nobel Prize in 1985. And please don't be shy. I'll be looking at the chat or if you want to say it, unmute. This is a memory test for today. Solitude. 100 Years of Solitude, very good, Cien Años de Soledad. Most people say uh, it's amor en los tiempos del cólera, but that is not true. Excellent, you passed your memory test today. Okay, so the main objective of our lab is really to, um, in, in broad terms, understand memory and understand what is the essence of memory, what allows us to learn and access those memories. And we focus very much on, in, in a broad sense, in to to toxicity and how tau may mediate brain, brain dysfunction. And we do that with three um, uh, focus points. First is with the objective of identifying novel therapeutic targets for telepathies. A second is to establish the molecular mechanisms, and that way we can understand how the brain works. And finally, if we can accomplish these things um, in, in strategically, we may target the, a central organelle, and we focused initially most of our studies on identifying uh, alterations in the endoplasmic reticulum and how those alterations may modify disease. We focused on tauopathies because there are m more than 20 neurodegenerative disorders that share that common pathological hallmark, which is the abnormal aggregation inside brain cells. I'd say more than brain cells, it's not just neurons, but also we see tufted astrocytes and other disorders, for example, and glia, they take up uh, tau. But in all of these cases, pathologically, we observe uh, this uh, abnormal, insoluble aggregate of tau. Most of our work focuses primarily on Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, and many subkinds, which include progressive supranuclear palsy, 
corticobasal degeneration, uh, Down syndrome. A component of our work also focuses on traumatic burn injury. And we've developed and, and been working on a model of uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which I can talk about in, a, in another opportunity. So this is uh, one of the ways that, that I like to, to express how I understand Alzheimer's disease. And it's all because of this artist, William Muttermullen, who uh, in 1967, you can see, was a very talented artist, and that's a self-portrait. He was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in 1995, and he had made a commitment to do a, uh, a self-portrait every year thereafter uh, until the year 2000. You can see through art how his faculties, I see aging, but also changes in how he can self-identify, self-visualize the use of color, perhaps some motor deficits. But at the end of the day, this is a, a typical sign of, of dementia. And it, it shows artistically how devastating this disease can be. So understanding why this happens has become a very important mission for us. Uh, as we all know, um, Alzheimer's disease was coined and first identified by Alois Alzheimer, uh, who was a psychiatrist and uh, treated Auguste D. Uh, over 100 years ago. And when she passed away in 1906, he uh, studied the brain and did the pathology. And he identified both plaques and tangles and the, as the two major pathological hallmarks of the disease. The plaques build up uh, outside of cells and they're composed primarily of amyloid beta peptides and they aggregate forming these highly reactive structures. Meanwhile, tangles, which is what we primarily know in the cell because it may interact with the nucleus through transcription and translation. It takes the RNA communicating through RNA to translate and make new proteins that can then be folded. So it requires chaperones. These new proteins may now be transported to the Golgi apparatus, to the plasma membrane. Uh, when proteins do not fold properly, they can be sh uh, shuttled for degradation through the proteasome or autophagy. When the endoplasmic reticulum in, uh, undergoes stress, it activates the unfolded protein response. And that may lead to an adaptive or a proapoptotic response. The endoplasmic reticulum also communicates with mitochondria through uh, MAMs, mitochondrial-associated membrane proteins, and uh, it regulates calcium homeostasis. Finally, the ER may also participate in lipid and carbohydrate metabolism at different rates in different cells. What we discovered uh, about seven years now was that tau associates with proteins surrounding the endoplasmic reticulum. And so we thought that if tau associates with any protein outside, then the function of the ER could be impaired. And not only that, if we could identify which proteins were affected, then we hypothesized that those, the function that those proteins initially would have could be affected by tau and disease. So we focused a little bit on the endoplasmic reticulum uh, leading to uh, ER stress and activation of the unfolded protein response. And we have done some work here unpublished with uh, the UPR in traumatic brain injury. We see that it's activated after 30 minutes. We, this is uh, looking at one of the branches of the UPR, which is uh, PERC. We also see it in spinal cord injury. Here we see the epicenter of the injury um, and the PERC staining goes away uh, distally, uh, away from the site. We've also established that the UPR, and this was the paper uh, seven years ago now, the, showing that tau accumulation activates the UPR. And we've also done some work in Down syndrome, indicating that the, um, the dynamics of ER stress are certainly more sensitive uh, in Down syndrome brains. But today what I would be, all, everything that I've shown is that we've, we're interested in translation, the formation of new proteins. <clears throat> and everything that I showed through the UPR and PERC leads to an indirect reduction of translation in protein synthesis. But here today, I'm going to talk about primarily our data uh, showing that there is a direct suppression of translation because of pathological tau. So uh, just to revisit a little bit of what we've done, uh, we identified that in human Alzheimer's brains, and these are late stage Alzheimer's disease, when we do a communal fluorescent stain for PHF1, which is a pathological hyperphosphor related conformer of tau, uh, and co-stain with an ER protein, calnexin, which rests on the outside of the ER membrane, we see partial colocalization. Uh, 
And I'm just uh, real quick. Can you see the mouse? Yes, yeah. with mouse. Excellent. Thank you. So here we see that there's partial colocalization, suggesting that tau associates with the outside of the endoplasmic reticulum. So here we're corroborating our work that we had published uh, a few years ago, and this is in Alzheimer's brains. Uh, so to establish which proteins associated with tau on the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, we uh, obtained brains from the University of Kentucky um, Biobank. And uh, we had Alzheimer's disease and controls, and we purified uh, endoplasmic reticulum with a simple sucrose gradient subcellular fractionation. We isolated microsomes, and then we did co-immunoprecipitation assays using uh, antibodies against actin or tau in these uh, microsomes uh, or ER uh, enriched fract fractions of Alzheimer's and control brains. We then ran them on a gel stained for Kumasi, cut the bands, <clears throat> and sent them for mass spectrometry. And we did this with two different antibodies, one with tau 5 which recognizes a region on the inside of the protein, but we also wanted to use a different antibody that picked up the carboxy terminus to make sure that whatever we were picking up was uh, mature tau, not just tau that was being translated. To our surprise in, in these two papers, the largest slice of these pies had to do with proteins that associated with tau and were involved in RNA translation. So to rephrase that, at least in 2015, using our first experiment, we found that many proteins associated with tau, but a large component of those functioned in RNA translation. And in our follow-up work, we identified that in Alzheimer's disease brains in particular, many of, the, of these RNA binding proteins uh, were much more robustly associating with tau in Alzheimer's disease compared to the controls. So not only were they different, but there were many, many more that associated with tau and disease. So now there's this, this enigmatic tau RNA binding protein interaction. Um, so we started looking into that and it turns out that the tau ribosome association had been first described uh, in 1987, over 30 years ago by uh, Skip Bender, late Skip Bender, uh, who identified that tau associated robustly, hyperphosphorated tau associated robustly in Alzheimer's brains, in neurons, and specifically in dendritic branching points. Since then, there have been many papers suggesting that there is a pathological relationship between tau and ribosomes. But most of these studies have been descriptive. The consequences of this interaction were unknown and so we, uh, we started looking at why did, does tau associate with ribosomes and what happens when that association occurs. So we did this work and published it uh, a few years ago in what I'll describe as our, the, uh, some of the work in this paper using three in vitro models. One is a cell-free assay, then uh, an inducible immortalized cell line, uh, which was stably ex uh, transfected to make uh, inducible uh, tet on tau expression, and finally, primary neurons from tau transgenic mice. <clears throat> Our hypothesis was that under normal conditions, tau associates with ribosomes and microtubules to allow localized translation of whatever proteins were needed. But in disease, pathological tau species may block ribosomes or prevent them from being efficient uh, translators. So to test this, initially, we wanted to corroborate some of the work that had been done previously over the last 30 years. So we went back to the human brain subcellular fractionation. But this time, we focused on two fractions, one that had no ribosomes and one that was enriched for ribosomes. And we compared it to the whole cell lysate. So in this Western blot, I'm showing you um, the subcellular fractions of control brains and Alzheimer's brains. And we have our whole cell lysate, so this is what it looks like normally, a uh, fraction without ribosomes, and a fraction where ribosomal proteins are enriched. And when we blot for total tau, you can see that the most dramatic difference is that the tau positive uh, bands occur in the Alzheimer's disease brains and only in the ribosomal fraction. And this high molecular weight uh, smear is rep uh, corresponds 
at least in part, to hyperphosphorylated perihelical filament tau. Now here I'm showing you some of our controls, which are uh, blotting for P0 and L28, which are ribosomal proteins. And this ensures that our purification of ribosomes was done properly. And we also blotted for HSP70 to ensure that being a soluble protein, there was no HSP70 in the ribosomal fraction. We also um, investigated whether it was just hyperphosphorylated tau that contributed to um, any kind of association, might have a higher affinity. And so we focused on these very soluble toxic tau oligomers, uh, here stained in red with the antibody T22. So uh, this again is a human Alzheimer's brain where we stained in red with T22 for tau oligomers, uh, very toxic, and co-stained for ribosomal protein S6, just as a marker of ribosomes. And we saw that there was uh, overlapping staining between these two. Once again, suggesting that there is a proximity, at least, of the T22 tau oligomer uh, protein and ribosomal proteins. So to establish whether the ribosome tau interaction affected translation, we did a cell-free in vitro translation assay. And what's really, um, it's a really clean and elegant experiment because all we have is a machinery to make proteins. That is to say ribosomes, tRNA, initiation factors, elongation factors, ATP, etc. And we can add then GFP plasma so that it can make new proteins and that will glow. And we can measure that with uh, uh, over six hours at 30 degrees with a 96 volt plate reader. Um, and so in each well, we added different uh, types of proteins. And here are the data. In panel A, I'm showing you the readout of GFP in wells that were incubated with all the machinery necessary for translation and BSA. So that's our control. But in those that we added tau oligomers, recombinant tau oligomers, we found uh, a 40% reduction in the amount of GFP that was uh, uh, evident, uh, evident. And you can see the curve is um, reduced early on in, in the readout. So translation efficiency is certainly reduced. But then to establish whether or not this is the consequence of an oligomeric conformation or tau oligomers more specifically, we did the same experiment using alpha-synuclein oligomers and insulin uh, oligomers, and we found no significant difference <clears throat> in the curve for GFP uh, compared to BSA. So these data suggest in a cell-free environment, tau may associate, tau oligomers may associate with ribosomes, and that in turn reduces the ability of these ribosomes to make new protein. So then we took it to an immortalized cell line, and we used an inducible HEK tau line. Now these cells uh, we developed in, in my, uh, my former lab as a postdoc in Chad Dickey's lab, uh, where we added tetracycline, uh, you can see, and it's a TET on system. So when you add tetracycline, uh, after 24 hours, you see robust expression of tau, and this increases over time over the course of four days. So now by adding tetracycline, we can tell the cell when to start and when to stop making uh, tau. And we coupled the use of these cells with a technique called sunset. This is also known as surfing, surface sensing of translation, so it stands for. And it's essentially based on the principle that pyromycin is uh, structurally analogous to transfer RNA, tRNA. So we add simply pyromycin to, our, to the media of the cells. Pyromycin uh, associates with uh, ribosomes to tag new proteins. And so any new protein being made at the time when we add pyromycin will have a pyromycin tag on it. So now we know which proteins are new. And we can detect that with uh, antibodies against pyromycin. So here's our experiment. We have our inducible HEK cells. We added tetracycline uh, over the course of three days. And you can see that total tau levels and PHF1 levels, hyperphosphorylated tau, increased over the course of those three days where the cells were exposed to tetracycline. But pyromycin, as we expected, uh, and as it labels new proteins, reduced as tau levels increased, suggesting that while 
pathological tau accumulates, protein synthesis is reduced. But to take it a step further, we did a rescue experiment. So here, over the course of four days of tau expression, we see certainly an increase in PHF1 and an expected reduction in pyromycin, which we would expect precisely from panel C. Here at the course of four days, it's much more pronounced. But then we removed tetracycline, washed the media off the cells, and added fresh media without tetracycline. And you can see that after one day and four days, there's a concomitant reduction of PHF1 and a rescue in translation. So again, suggesting that this change in translation is observed not only in an immortalized cell line, but also as a consequence of pathological tau levels. So finally, uh, for this particular uh, section in our in vitro assays, we used primary neurons to establish how relevant is this to the brain. And uh, we used primary neurons from the RTG 4510 tau transgenic model. Uh, Dr. Jada Lewis uh, shared these mice with us while we were in Kentucky and established our line. And these mice, it's important to note that they overexpress 13 times the levels of tau. And in this case, it's a human mutant tau for, uh, for R0N. And it has a mutation that is associated with frontotemporal dementia. And that's P301L. An advantage of these mice is that they present robust, aggressive pathology and cognitive deficits um, by three to uh, five months. So we made the primary neural cultures, and again, we did our experiment. So we blotted for human tau, and here I'm showing you that tau was expressed only in the transgenics, and um, in the non-transgenics, there was no tau. Pyromycin levels, as expected based on our previous experiments, were reduced uh, in the transgenics. And one of the proteins that we measured uh, that, were, that represents uh, at least one element of synaptic function is PSD95, and the levels of PSD95 were reduced in these mice. It could be because of reduction in translation. But it might be because there's a change in transcription. So to test that, here I have the quantification of pure myosin reduced in the uh, transgenic neurons, and PSD95 levels reduced. But then, is it a matter of, of transcription? So we did RT-PCR to measure changes in, uh, tr in um, transcription of PSD95, and we saw that there was a uh, two and a half fold increase in RNA for PSD95 in the transgenic cells. So in other words, there's more RNA of PSC, for PSC95 and less protein. So again, suggesting that there's a block in, or a reduction in translation, okay? So at least in vitro, I've shown you that indeed the uh, accumulation of pathological tau species, whether it's oligomeric and deep fossil related, or hyperphosphorylated uh, impacts the ribosome in a way that reduces its ability to make new proteins. But then we didn't know if the same effect would happen in vivo. Certainly the brain is much more complex than cells in culture. So we went back to the RTG 4510 mice. And here I want to mention that uh, Jada, who was one of the co-creators of the mice, had astutely introduced a, uh, a system to suppress tau expression. And in this case, it's using a TET off system. In other words, we can feed doxycycline or tetracycline to the mice and they will stop making tau. Um, to a word to the uh, graduate students and postdocs, if you're stubborn enough, I think you can get things done in the lab. And this is an argument that I had with a graduate student in the lab, uh, Shelby Meyer, very talented and she said, well, Joe, if we inject pyromycin to do the sunset experiment in the brain, uh, if we do it IP, it'll work. And this is a big challenge because we wanted to do sunset in vivo, and we kept injecting it um, in the brain directly, and the results were just too inconsistent. So I was ready to give up on this, and she insisted, well, let's just inject IP. And after a long conversation of an hour, I gave up. I said, fine, do it. And she did it. And sure enough, she found that pyromycin stained neurons after one hour of injection. And here we found that at five months, there was a reduction that was much more pronounced at seven months. Here we have our non-transgenics and our transgenics. But when we did the quantification, we found that this difference in pyromycin signal was only statistically significant at seven months. So whatever we observed in the cells, this reduction in translation occurred late in the 4510s. 
Now this was perplexing because at this stage, the mice are, are really sick. They really are cognitively impaired. And what we're more interested is what's happening in the early stage of the, uh, uh, stages of the disease. And as I mentioned, one of the important features of the mice is that they develop aggressive pathology and cognitive impairment by five months. So now we investigated, well, maybe it's not just suppression of translation. Is there a shift of translation? Maybe some proteins are reduced early on and others might be increased. So to test that, we um, uh, took into consideration the careful steps in the, in the pathology before five months of age in these mice. And here uh, I'm showing you that tau expression is driven by the ChemK2 alpha promoter. So tau is only expressed in four brain neurons and it happens after birth. So tau's ex expression occurs between two and three weeks, although it's important to note that it's a leaky promoter, so some of it is made earlier on. Uh, pathology, you can start observing it by two and a half months, some early stages, uh, pre-tangle uh, aggregates. By uh, about four and a half months, there is substantial cognitive impairment. Uh, neural deficits can appear by three to four months, uh, and there's substantial, substantial atrophy by five months. So here we use a control which was suppressing tau expression by, uh, at this stage. And in doing so, we would have a good control of, well, tau's expressed, but it stops. And now the mice, we know from the paper in 2005 in Science that Jada published that the, um, the cognitive impairment was rescued. So now we have a nice control at the same age. There's no effect of aging. And we did pyromycin in vivo uh, proteomics. So we injected pyromycin, we took half the brain for a microarray, and that way we could establish a baseline for RNA. And then we uh, did the pyromycin, which we could pull down and do mass spectrometry to identify any new protein that's made during that hour of injection. This is to show that our doxycycline treatment reduced tau levels by 50%. And here are the results of the microarray. This is just telling us what's happening at the RNA level. We found three distinct patterns. Uh, and and uh, here is a pattern showing that in our non-transgenics, whether they were treated with doxycycline or not, some genes were not changed. In the transgenics, these genes were substantially changed and they were rescued back with suppression of tau expression. The other two patterns corresponded to those that were not changed by, pyramide, by doxycycline or those that were the resulting uh, a result of doxycycline. And this is an important control to include in these studies. Not surprisingly, this antibiotic suppressed um, or was responsible for changing the transcription of RNAs involved in inflammation. But what was most important to us at this time was to evaluate what happens to transcription of ribosomal proteins or any other protein involved in translation. And it turns out that proteins involved in the ribosomal machinery were not changed, whether they were in the transgenic mice or uh, treated with doxycycline. So again, there was no change in RNA for our proteins of interest. So again, we pulled down pure myosin on the contralateral brain, did mass spectrometry, and identified uh, uh, a series of changes in the types of proteins that we can detect. So, for example, we found no differences in the non-transgenic samples, whether treated with doxycycline or not. We established that proteins involved in translation were reduced. And here we just have an arbitrary number for quantification. In the non-transgenics, here we see in the translational and ribosomal uh, uh, gene ontology uh, component there was a substantial and significant reduction of proteins in the transgenic mice. But when we treated those with doxycycline and suppressed our expression, we found a, um, that it, there was a rescue in the synthesis of these proteins, in the translation of these proteins that are involved in more translation. So the whole machinery uh, can be uh, sensitive to the expression of pathological tau and maybe the accumulation of pathological tau. So we focused on this pro uh, ribosomal protein S6 next because of the basic biology of this protein. It is a major regulator of translation. Simply put, when S6 is phosphorylated, it serves as a gatekeeper to establish which RNAs will be translated. 
Uh, it corresponds to uh, uh, five prime top mRNA, which is a family of uh, transcripts that ha have a five prime terminal oligopyrimidine. As I mentioned, it's activated by phosphorylation. And when this occurs, it becomes uh, phosphorylated when the cells are going to grow. And so when cells are growing, they need more ribosomes. All of these five prime top, five prime top mRNAs constitute ribosomal proteins, initiation factors, and elongation factors. So uh, S6 inherently drives the translation of ribosomes and ribosomal machinery. So we hypothesize that if tau levels were increased, then uh, we would find that S6 levels or phosphor S6 levels would be decreased. And that could explain why there is, at least in this part, a reduction in the production of ribosomal proteins. So we went back to our uh, inducible HEK line. And here you see that after uh, addition of tetracycline to the cells, there is a substantial uh, increase in PHF1 and total tau levels compared to no hours. And that increases uh, at 96. And when we remove tetracycline for one day, we get, again, a curve where PHF1 and total tau levels are um, driven by tetracycline expression. What was surprising uh, was that after four days, phospho 6 levels were virtually undetectable with, uh, uh, to when in, in the, the cells where PHF1 levels were highest. Then uh, going back uh, to our paper in 2016, we had pulled out ribosomal protein S6 just uh, as, a, uh, as a marker for ribosomes. There was no reason um, for picking it as, as, a, as a focus point like we did more recently. <clears throat> and we found then, I'll remind you, that tau oligomers associated in some way by overlapping staining in the Alzheimer's brain. So to more carefully define that interaction, we did communal precipitations of S6 or tau and control brains and in late AD uh, brains. And we found that both proteins communal precipitated together. Importantly, in the late stage AD, uh, this interaction was much more robust. That is, tau communal precipitate uh, communal precipitate with S6 more robustly than in the controls. But again, we need to confirm that this effect is a consequence of perhaps translation and not transcription. So here, protein in vivo. Uh, adding to a lot of the complexity of the system. So now we're going back to some very basic characterization of this interaction. In this uh, slide, I'm showing you uh, preliminary data uh, where we've tried to establish what part of tau is necessary for its association with the ribosome or ribosomal proteins. And here we essentially co-transfected flag tag uh, uh, truncated constructs of tau that lack the entire proline-rich region or two of the major areas of the proline-rich region. And we see that when those areas are missing and you pull it down, S6 and RPL19 no longer co-immunoprecipitate with that proline-rich region, suggesting that these regions are important for associating with the ribosomes. So that starts to give us, found that the immunoprecipitation was very weak in these brains. But then we, uh, Brock 3 and 4, uh, did the RNA-seq uh, to complete the CLIP exp experiment and compare what happens into the early moderate stages and the severe stages of Alzheimer's. And we're still analyzing the data. But we found already some, some fascinating results that I want to share with you today. Here I'm showing the types of RNAs that pull down with tau in our moderate AD and our severe AD. Here we have the vast majority of the RNAs that are associated with tau corresponded to those that are on the 3' UTR or in the coding sequence. And then there's a shift. In severe cases of AD, we found that the majority of the RNAs that associated with tau corresponded to distal introns. Part of it well, were coding sequences, and now we have an enrichment of RNAs coding for uh, that uh, represent non-coding exons. Uh, we have a reduction, but still prevalence of three prime uh, UTR transcripts. 
One final thing in our results that again this is this is all fairly new um, and we're still working out is that th there were these consensus regions that um, associate with tau more robustly and while there's a lot of variability here I want to show you and highlight uh, that most of the tau associated with RNAs and these consensus sequences and there's one particular sequence that is interesting and that's these accumulations of poly A's. And you can see that very prevalent, not only in moderate, but also in the severe cases of Alzheimer's disease. So there might be something here um, in which tau, whether on its own directly or as a form of a complex, maybe in a uh, liquid phase separated stress granule of some sort, may stabilize or irreversibly stabilize the ability of cells to transport or stabilize that type of RNA because it's affecting the poly A sequence. So to conclude, um, I'm, I, I've shown you data and this is just to summarize that at least in vitro we found that tau associates with the ribosomal complex and reduces their ability to make polypeptides but at least in vivo uh, the, the picture is much more complex we don't know if it's interaction with RNA specifically, with messenger RNAs, with tRNAs, uh, or the ribosome, or just bringing it all as a, as a complex. But the outcomes are quite different because what we find is some level of selectivity uh, that is shifted. In other words, some transcripts will be translated and others are not. And this is just to, to put it down on take home bullets. Uh, tau associates within plasma reticulum proteins, and that's what I showed at the beginning of the talk. The most common are factors that regulate translation. I showed that pathological tau interferes with ribosomal function and thereby reduces synthesis of ribosomal proteins. Uh, I showed that this phenomenon occurs in Alzheimer's, where tau engages with S6, and that S6's function by phosphorylation in, appears to be reduced. Um, in vivo, pathological tau shifts not only the transcriptome, but also the translatome. And so th this is important to, to, to establish whether the changes that we observe are a consequence of more RNA, RNA abundance. And then finally, studies to identify the proteins altered in, these, uh, uh, in the tau ribosome complex, um, are, we're working on it, and I showed you some of those early results. Uh, I want to thank all the people that were essential to make these uh, experiments. A lot of this work started at the University of Kentucky with Shelby. Um, and now in Florida, followed up by Sean Corrin. Uh, Shelby graduated, and uh, so I should have put a PhD there. Uh, she's now doing a postdoc at Vanderbilt. Sean moved, and he's applying for medical student uh, school. He's at the University of Rochester. Matt is a postdoc in the lab who uh, uh, helped finish up a lot of the studies for our last paper. Uh, and here uh, we received the mice from Jada Lewis. Pete Nelson is the neuropathologist, an outstanding neuropathologist at the University of Kentucky who is not just uh, an, an amazing colleague and mentor, but friend. Uh, I want to thank Chad Dickey, who uh, regretfully passed away not too long ago. He's my postdoc advisor uh, at the University of South Florida. And much of the work that I've presented today was inspired by my work with him in his lab. Also, the late Peter Davies, who passed away just a few weeks ago, uh, who was a constant supporter of our work and shared many of his antibodies with us. Rakes Kayed shared not only the uh, T22 antibody, but also many uh, 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 recombinant proteins. And of course, our funding from the NIH, uh, the Department of Defense, um, we did some work with GlaxoSmithKline and some of the data that I showed today, but that's uh, mostly for another story, and the Alzheimer's Association. And um, here's the lab which is uh, now changed a little bit. We have new, new members like John, who's not here in this picture, and I need to update it. And so I'll just leave us with this uh, message from Garcia Marquez uh, that this perhaps is not the first time, it won't be the last time, that we're quarantined or forced to stay in a ship um, because of um, any disorder, disease, infectious disease like cholera. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Joe. Thank you for your presentation. Muchas gracias. Muy buena presentación. Me gustó mucho. Gracias.
Thank you very um, much. Very good presentation, Joy. <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate that. I don't know if Cecilia and Claudio want to work with some questions. Then I can I add think, one later. I think you should uh, make your questions first, yes. Michelle. Okay. Oh, Joe, that, that's an amazing amount of data. It's impressive. Uh, I have been following the papers, of course, closely. That's my intro. But it, it, it's impressive that you, you're interested in understanding what exactly uh, is happening in this association between found and ribosome. But Thank I guess you so much, Michelle. Do whether, uh, do you think that the reduction in S6 signaling or phosphorylation is something that comes up from upstream signaling by mTOR, for example, or it's something directly at the ribosome which somehow impairs the phosphorylation by S X S6K? I think it's definitely upstream and it's very likely through S6 kinases. Now, which kinase it is is unclear. Um, and it's, it's, as you know, it's, it's probably a very complex system, um, given that uh, S6 kinases come from such a long uh, pathway that is heavily regulated at different places. It very well may be that, uh, as we know, tau affects autophagy and it's in turn can feed back into the whole mTOR pathway, then affecting S6 kinases and so on. Uh, what we're finding, at least in, in our work, is just the fact that S6 is not as phosphorylated. And perhaps that has something to do, <clears throat> and it may just coincide with the fact that those cells are to, uh, are harboring uh, toxic species. All right, thank you. Impressive. Thank you so much, Michelle. Okay, so in the chat we have a question from Felipe Cabral Miranda. Uh, asking if your data indicates that phosphatau physically interacts with the ribosome complex. Thus, blocking protein synthesis, and uh, he also says that. But we also know that phosphatau can activate PR, namely phosphorc, thus also mediating uh, protein synthesis. How do you think those two somehow overlapping signaling cascades can mediate the time course of protein synthesis shut down in the demented brain? Okay, um, there's a lot there, uh, Felipe. Yeah. <laughs> so. True. I'm so sorry. Oh no, Felipe, <laughs> that's fine. So what I, what I'm gonna do is say something. Uh, uh, let's go by parts. So. Uh, can you see the I chat? Yeah. yeah, I can see it now. I found it. So. Okay. Uh, Felipe, I would say that I don't. I cannot tell you with certainty that tau physically interacts with ribosomes. Um. I could say that it forms a complex. <clears throat> it seems as though tau is a non-classical RNA binding protein. We know that tau is in stress granules uh, by work from Ben Wolosin. And so that's one thing I want to clar uh, clarify. Um, and so that could reduce translation. Now, we know that fossil tau can activate the unfolded protein response. Yeah, we do. Namely, PERC. And so mediating protein synthesis. That's correct. Um, so the, the question you ask is, is well put, is does tau affect translation directly through the ribosome and RNA or indirectly through PERC? Exactly. Uh, because your data indicates that it happens both ways, right? Mm -hmm. At least right. I got this impression. So do, do you think there's some kind of time course like phosphatau first and activates PERC? or PKR, I don't know, and then it can bind directly to the ribosome complex and so on. How do you think this happens during the, the course of, of the mention? Um, I think it's ribosomal disruption first. And I can say that based on our data on the RTG4510 mice. Because in the RTG4510 mice, we observe these changes at five months. And PERC-mediated reduction in translation does not occur in these mice until after six months. Perfect. Okay, so maybe maybe Claudia wants to ask from YouTube. No. Uh oh. YouTube. Okay. Well, She's gone. I have a uh, Mariana asked a question. Uh, yes, go okay. for it. Mariana. Okay. So Mariana was wondering whether tau can sequester specific tRNAs. Great question. And have I measured whether some tRNAs are decreased or increased? 
Yes, so the report with Park Clip showed the tau RNA binding selectivity uh, for tRNAs in living cells. Yes, so in fact, that paper inspired us to do this work. Um, they did it with uh, iPSCs, which presents different kinds of challenges. Certainly, it's much cleaner because you have one cell type, but at the same time, it's uh, uh, it is it is. I think it's more physiological certainly to take it from a human brain with Alzheimer's disease and in the human brain we have more diversity of tau um, isoforms so iPSCs primarily make 3R tau here we could have a bigger picture and they also identify tRNAs and I also have a list of tRNAs and they were robustly associated with tau but like I said we just got these data and I have a spreadsheet and we're just going through it so if you would like I'm happy to share those data with you they're unpublished, and I don't care. Uh, just send me an email, and, and we can share those data. Great. Um. Uh, one thing, let, let me let me uh, uh, make a, an, an interesting finding here is that we found that uh, in the severe stage of AD, and this is a point to be careful about, we found mitochondrial tRNA associated with tau. We're perplexed by this, but it certainly tells us that you know tau is not in mitochondria. So in the severe cases, probably what we're finding is that in Brox 5 and 6, it is so destroyed that brain tissue has lost so much integrity that mitochondria have ruptured, and now mitochondrial tRNA may be associating with tau. That's what we, we think. Um, there's a question from Vic Victor Bodart. Hi, Joe. So he knows you. Nice to hear from you again. Do you know if this translation problems associated with tau require a specific tau conformation? Yes, I think it requires um, the oligomeric conformation. And I ask that uh, because um, in our in vitro assays, which I didn't show you, is that when we use tau monomers and fibrils, we did not see such a strong change that um, I did that make sense Victor mm -hmm. Victor you, you hear me yes did that make sense oh yeah um, my, my ask is just about this because uh, I know that some difference conformations have no too much uh, represents the like the, the disease yes and right. I'm not Question: If I can, if I can do it, just you have, um, do you have CG's mechanisms associated with tau pathology, more associated with this tau mutant, yeah, like the frontotemporal dimension mutations, right? But do you have C2 in Alzheimer's disease brain? Yes. Right. So other folks. Um, uh, so so first. Yeah, just to clarify, yes, in the in vitro translation assays, I'm showing that the most toxic conformer of tau that led to this impairment was oligomeric tau. And it doesn't necessarily have to be phosphorylated. But that's not to say that uh, we haven't tested phosphorylated forms because we're not making recombinant phosphorylated tau. But we could fish that out from cells, but it's not a technique we're interested in doing right now. In the primary neurons in vitro, we use the... Um, the mutant tau in the mice we use mutant tau p 3 l but our immortalized cells we've used uh the wild type tau we use another mutation and in the human alzheimer's brains i'm showing you obviously not mutant tau and 3r 4r so we have a broad variability of different tau conformers that uh affect the system uh, we can dissect it further uh as we go um so i don't know if i answered your question Oh, no, yeah, it's fine, it's fine, it's good. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now Sergio wants, Sergio Ferreira wants to make a question. Hi, Sergio. So can you show no, up? Thanks for this really lovely talk. Thank you so, so much. I think your, your data are uh, really uh, crystal clear. I think they're like night and day when you have or have not tau. Your results are very clear, but uh, this is exactly the point that I want to bring about. When, you, when you're using the mutant mice, you mentioned that these mice overexpress 
13 times tau compared to a wild type mouse, yeah, to a non transgenic mouse. Mm -hmm. In the case of the primary, of the, not the primary neurons, I, I don't remember that exactly what you use there, but in the case of the prospected cells, you go from zero tau to essentially a lot of tau. So it's an infinite an increase uh, in tau. So uh, this is the kind of question that one often gets when you're talking about transgenics. So, to what extent do you think this massive amount of tau is simply not creating some uh, effect that's not really physiological? It's just interactions which are showing up now. I'm not saying the interactions are not there. They obviously are there. But are they, are they really uh, going on in the AD brain? Or are they taking place in these models because there is such a massive amount of tau that's been expressed? That is an excellent question. It now makes you suspicious of reviewing my grant. And uh, <laughs> this is exactly what they say. And, and this triggers something that I didn't answer to Victor. And it's that um, it happens in Alzheimer's, other people have shown in Alzheimer's disease that there are shifts in the uh, polysome profiles. So there seems to be a problem with the profile conformation in Alzheimer's brains. Now, precisely because of what you said, that there's tau overexpression, it only makes sense that, well, you're overwhelming the system with too much RNA, and that could be responsible for taking everything over. And when you reduce tau expression, certainly you're getting a rescue. Yes. But um, that's why we're trying to use different models. And so here, using the mice, we can't walk away from it. Uh, even if we seed the, the, the mice, that is one option we're investigating that right now. But we just went for the home run with human brains because they're not overexpressing tau. What we find is an accumulation of tau. And what we're hoping is that with the mice, at least the human brains may represent a stage in the mice where it's not a matter of overexpressing protein, rather an accumulation of protein. Yeah, but in the human brain, of course, there is, in addition to tau, which is obviously your favorite protein, we know there is a massive accumulation of A-beta species, which also uh, affect the translatome and, and, and block protein synthesis, may differentially uh, uh, inhibit a few and stimulate the synthesis of other proteins. So, uh, it, in the human brain, it's more descriptive. It's hard to figure out exactly who's causing that change right. in, in translation, right? Because right. something else other than tau. Um, yeah. It's... So I think maybe in the... answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. What I was thinking is that maybe in the mice, what you would need would be to show that even without reducing the total uh, RNA load uh, and, and inducing a rescue by virtue of reducing total RNA, maybe what you need is really to block the interaction between tau and your key target protein. If it's X S six, then really that that should be one of the focus. I mean, fi figuring out if you can design a peptide, for example, that will block that interaction and rescue the phenotype. Absolutely right. And so that's exactly why we're going after the basic mechanisms of tau ribosome interaction. What we've done so far is at least map the side of tau that associates with ribosomes. Mm -hmm. And now we need to find out what part of the ribosome associates with tau. But it's been a challenge because we pull down tau and we pull down, you know, any kind of ribosomal proteins, right? And so I think this will require, as I mentioned, some more uh, sophisticated imaging um, to try to find that interaction site of tau and ribosomes. And then design that peptide to compete exactly as you said, to compete tau off of that ribosome. And that would certainly give us, um, at this point, the hope of some form of therapeutic strategy. Yeah. Because, you know, we know that town knockouts have uh, improvements. So maybe this could be a mechanism in which we can just get rid of town. I don't know. It, it's something that we're, we're battling, um, and we're battling uh, the model issue. That was really nice. Thank you very much. Thank you much. Brilliant presentation. Excellent question. Uh, I guess we don't have any more questions. Okay. Um, so I want to thank you so much. It was thank excellent. So Great to have you. And excellent talk and uh, responding to questions was also fantastic. Thank this is such a much. pleasure.
such a pleasure and such a special opportunity for me. This means a lot. Thank you so much for the invitation. And, and I hope we get to see you soon. Um, en una conferencia, o en Rio, en Colombia, o en la Florida. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Michelle uh, can do his closing words there. Yeah, I just have to thank Joe because it was awesome. It was impressive to have your talk here. And I hope we can meet soon, of course. I hope this pandemic goes over and we're able to attend conferences and invite you to come to Rio for a presidential seminar here. That would be wonderful. Um, not during the World Cup qualifier, but yes, I'll, I'll go another time. <laughs> It would be sad to have you here during the qualifiers. John. It would be difficult. It would be so sad. <laughs> it would be very, muy difícil. <laughs> muy, muy difícil. Bueno, right. hasta luego. Hasta luego. Thank you. Bye. Hey. Obrigada, Michelle.